some of the poetry of the 1880s. This decade saw the death of Browning, and if not the death of Tennyson, then the writing and publication of the poem he insisted should stand at the end of all editions of his poems. Browning's volume, Asolando, was published on the very day, December the 12th, 1889, on which he died in Venice, though an advanced copy did reach him beforehand. It's a collection of smaller scale pieces than he'd been publishing in the years that led up to it, and this is its epilogue, a deliberate farewell, hortatory, spry, and clearly by no one but Browning. At the midnight in the silence of the sleep time, when you set your fancies free, will they pass to where, by death, fools think imprisoned, lo, he lies who once so loved you, whom you loved so? Pity me. Oh, to love so, be so loved, yet so mistaken. What had I on earth to do with the slothful, with the mawkish, the unmanly? Like the aimless, helpless, hopeless did I drivel, being who? One who never turned his back but marched breast forward, never doubted clouds would break, never dreamed, though right were worsted, wrong would triumph, held we fall to rise, are baffled to fight better, sleep to wake. No, at noonday in the bustle of men's work time, greet the unseen with a cheer, bid him forward, breast and back as either should be, strive and thrive, cry speed, fight on, fare ever, there as here. Tennyson, too, wrote his own deliberate epilogue, which we'll come to in a moment. But he wrote another kind of epilogue, too, of a more troubled kind. Tennyson's Locksley Hall was published in his 1842 volume. In 1886, he wrote and published its sequel, Locksley Hall, Sixty Years After, a poem written in the same trochaic measure. Tennyson said he was told that the English people liked verse in trochaic, so I wrote the poem in this metre but much more disillusioned, impassioned, even bitter, full of invective against the spirit of the age. Here's an extract from round about the middle of the poem. Chaos, cosmos, cosmos, chaos. Once again the sickening game. Freedom free to slay herself, and dying while they shout her name. Step by step we gain the freedom, known to Europe, known to all. Step by step we rose to greatness. Through the tungsters we may fall. You that woo the voices, tell them old experience is a fool. Teach your flattered kings that only those who cannot read can rule. Pluck the mighty from their seat, but set no meek ones in their place. Pillory wisdom in your markets, pelt your offal at her face. Tumble nature, heel or head, and yelling with the yelling street, set the feet above the brain, and swear the brain is in the feet. Bring the old dark ages back, without the faith, without the hope. Break the state, the church, the throne, and roll their ruins down the slope. Authors, essayist, atheist, novelist, realist, rhymester, play your part. Paint the mortal shame of nature with the living hues of art. Rip your brother's vices open, strip your own foul passions bare. Down with reticence, down with reverence, forward, naked, let them stare. Feed the budding rose of boyhood with the drainage of your sewer. Send the drain into the fountain, lest the stream should issue pure. Set the maiden fancies wallowing in the troughs of Zolaism. Forward, forward, I and backward, downward too into the abysm. Do your best to charm the worst, to lower the rising race of men. Have we risen from out the beast, then back into the beast again? Only dust to dust for me that sicken at your lawless din. Dust in wholesome old world dust before the newer world begin. Heated am I? You, you wonder. Well, it scarce becomes mine age. Patience, let the dying actor mouth his last upon the stage. Tennyson never intended that that should be his last word or those his last sentiments. In October 1889, he was crossing the Solent when, in a matter of twenty minutes, he later said, 
he wrote some lines which he repeated to his son Hallam that evening. That is the crown of your life's work, Hallam said. Here it is. Sunset and evening star and one clear call for me. And may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea. But such a tide as moving seems asleep, too full for sound and foam, when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home. Twilight and evening bell, and after that the dark. And may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out our bourne of time and place the flood may bear me far, I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. With the deaths of Browning and of Tennyson within a few years, the great Victorian poets, those who commanded the allegiance of a whole nation, were at an end. During the deliberations that led up to Alfred Austin's disastrous appointment as laureate, Queen Victoria is reported to have said, I am told that Mr. Swinburne is the best poet in my dominions. Well, on the strength of work we've heard in an earlier programme, he possibly was. But there were several things against Swinburne. The taints of accusations about his work's fleshliness and blasphemy. The reports of and gossip about his own unlaudiate-like behaviour with the bottle and at the receiving end of the lash. And perhaps least among the official considerations, the fact that the quality, though not the quantity, of his poems had diminished. By the 1880s, he'd become an unconscious self-parodist, and at least once a conscious one. Let's catch him at that point with his own piece of self-mockery, Nephelidia. From the depths of the dreamy decline of the dawn, through a notable nimbus of nebulous moonshine, pallid and pink as the palm of the flag flower that flickers with fear of the flies as they float, are they looks of our lovers that lustrously lean from a marvel of mystic, miraculous moonshine, these that we feel in the blood of our blushes that thicken and threaten with throbs through the throat? Thicken and thrill as a theatre thronged at appeal of an actor's appalled agitation, fainter with fear of the fires of the future than pale with the promise of pride in the past, flushed with the famishing fullness of fever that reddens with radiance of wraith recreation, gaunt as the ghastliest of glimpses that gleam through the gloom of the gloaming when ghosts go aghast. Nay, for the nick of the tick of the time is a tremulous touch on the temples of terror, strained as the sinews yet strenuous with strife of the dead, who is dumb as the dust heaps of death. Surely no soul is it, sweet as the spasm of erotic, emotional, exquisite error, bathed in the balms of beatified bliss, beatific itself by beatitude's breath. Surely no spirit or sense of a soul that was soft to the spirit and soul of our senses sweetens the stress of suspiring suspicion that sobs in the semblance and sound of a sigh. Only this oracle opens Olympian in mystical moods and triangular tenses. Life is the lust of a lamp for the light that is dark till the dawn of the day when we die. Mild is the murk and monotonous music of memory, melodiously mute as it may be, while the hope in the heart of the hero is bruised by the breach of men's rapiers resigned to the rod, made meek as a mother whose bosom beats bound with the bliss-bringing bulk of a balm-breathing baby as they grope through the graveyard of creeds and the skies growing green at a groan for the grimness of God. Blank is the book of his bounty beholden of old, and its binding is blacker than bluer. Out of blue into black is the scheme of the skies, and their dews are the wine of the bloodshed of things. Till the darkling desire of delight shall be free as a form that is freed from the fangs that pursue her, 
Till the heartbeats of hell shall be hushed by a hymn from the hunt that has harried the kennel of kings. There's something innocent, almost childlike, about Swinburne's pleasure there. And that's more directly true of a book published in 1885, Robert Louis Stevenson's A Child's Garden of Verses, a book which has pieces in it which still have currency, as in this one, which perhaps uncharacteristically captures a moment of darkness in both a literal and a figurative sense. Shadow March. All round the house is the jet black night. It stares through the window pane. It crawls in the corners, hiding from the light, and it moves with the moving flame. Now my little heart goes a beating like a drum with the breath of the bogey in my hair, and all round the candle the crooked shadows come and go marching along up the stair. The shadow of the balusters, the shadow of the lamp, the shadow of the child that goes to bed, all the wicked shadows coming, tramp, 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 with the black night overhead. The 1880s saw not only Stevenson's Child's Garden, but other enduring work by him, all great successes at the time. Treasure Island, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, kidnapped. One of Stevenson's greatest friends and keenest supporters was his almost exact contemporary, Edmund Goss, already known as a poet and as an industrious literary critic, but whose one undoubted masterpiece had to wait until 1907, Father and Son. Nowadays, Goss is entirely forgotten as a poet. His representation in Quilla Cooch's Oxford Book of English Verse is of no interest. But he did write a tiny handful, less than a handful, of poems which have both poignancy and skill. Here's the best of them, published in 1889, a poem which relates interestingly to father and son and deserves to be rescued. The Wallpaper by Edmund Goss When I was only five years old, my mother, who was soon to die, raised me with fingers soft and cold on high, until, against the parlour wall, I reached a golden paper flower. How proud was I, and ah, how tall that hour. This shining tulip shall be yours, your own, your very own, she said. The mark that made it mine endures in red. I scarce could see it from the floor. I craned to touch the scarlet sign. No gift so precious had before been mine. A paper tulip on a wall, a boon that ownership defied, yet this was dearer far than all beside. Real toys, real flowers that lavish love had strewn before me, all and each grew pale beside this gift above my reach. Ah, now that time has worked its will and fooled my heart and dazed my eyes, delusive tulips prove me still unwise. Still, still the eluding flower that glows above the hands that yearn and clasp seems brighter than the genuine rose I grasp. So has it been since I was born. So will it be until I die. Stars, the best flowers of all, adorn the sky. The whole matter of what was called aestheticism belongs as much to the 1880s as the 1890s. Patience, first produced in 1881, was a satirical comic opera which at once caught a mood of the moment. W.S. Gilbert, collaborating with Arthur Sullivan, had been, among other things, a glittering producer of verbal technical feats for some five or six years. He excelled himself in patience, from which this chorus comes. Ideally, it needs Sullivan's music, too, but it can stand perfectly well by itself. If you're anxious for to shine in the high aesthetic line as a man of culture rare, you must get up all the germs of the transcendental terms and plant them everywhere. 
You must lie upon the daisies and discourse in novel phrases of your complicated state of mind. The meaning doesn't matter if it's only idle chatter of a transcendental kind. And everyone will say, as you walk your mystic way, if this young man expresses himself in terms too deep for me, why, what a very singularly deep young man this deep young man must be. Be eloquent in praise of the very dull old days which have long since passed away, and convince them, if you can, that the reign of good Queen Anne was culture's palmiest day. Of course you will poo-poo whatever's fresh and new, and deter it's crude and mean, for art stopped short in the cultivated court of the Empress Josephine. And everyone will say, as you walk your mystic way, if that's not good enough for him, which is good enough for me, why, what a very cultivated kind of youth this kind of youth must be. Then a sentimental passion of a vegetable passion must excite your languid spleen, an attachment a la Plato for a bashful young potato or a not-too French French bean. Though the Philistines may jostle, you will rank as an apostle in the high aesthetic band if you walk down Piccadilly with a poppy or a lily in your medieval hand. And everyone will say, as you walk your flowery way, if he's content with a vegetable love which would certainly not suit me, why, what a most particularly pure young man this pure young man must be. In 1889, there died another very different, dazzling technician. But, with a handful of exceptions, the poems of Gerard Manley Hopkins had to wait another 29 years to be published, carefully, if not entirely sympathetically, presented by his friend Robert Bridges. In 1882, Hopkins wrote a poem for two voices. Of it, he wrote to another friend, R. W. Dixon, I never did anything more musical. The leaden echo and the golden echo. How to keep, is there any, any, is there none such, nowhere known some, bow or brooch or braid or brace, lace, latch or catch or key to keep back beauty, keep it beauty, beauty, beauty from vanishing away. Oh, is there no frowning of these wrinkles, ranked wrinkles deep down? No waving off of these most mournful messengers, still messengers, sad and stealing messengers of grey. No, there's none, there's none, oh no, there's none. Nor can you long be what you now are called fair. Do what you may do, what do what you may. And wisdom is early to despair. Be beginning, since no, nothing can be done to keep at bay age and age's evils, hoar hair. Ruck and wrinkle, drooping, dying, death's worst, winding sheets, tombs and worms and tumbling to decay. So be beginning, be beginning to despair. Oh, there's none, no, 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 there's none. Be beginning to despair, to despair. Despair, 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 despair. Spare. There is one, yes, I have one, hush there, only not within seeing of the sun, not within the singeing of the strong sun, tall suns tinging, or treacherous the tainting of the earth's air. Somewhere, elsewhere, there is, ah, well, where, one, one. Yes, I can tell such a key, I do know such a place where whatever's prized and passes of us, everything that's fresh and fast flying of us, seems to us sweet of us and swiftly away with, done away with, undone, undone, done with, soon done with, and yet dearly and dangerously sweet of us, the wimpled, water dimpled, not by morning matched face, the flower of beauty, fleece of beauty, too, too apt to are to fleet, never fleets more, fastened with the tenderest truth to its own best being and its loveliness of youth. It is an everlastingness of, oh, it is an all youth. Come then, your ways and airs and looks, locks, maiden gear, gallantry and gaiety and grace, winning ways, airs, innocent, maiden manners, sweet looks, loose locks, long locks, love locks, gay gear, going gallant, girl grace. Resign them, sign them, seal them, send them, motion them with breath, and with sighs, soaring, soaring sighs, deliver them. Beauty and the ghost, deliver it early now, long before death. Give beauty back. 
Beauty, beauty, beauty back to God, beauty's self and beauty's giver. See, not a hair is, not an eyelash, not the least lash lost. Every hair is hair of the head numbered. Nay, what we had light-handed left in surly the mere mould will have waked and have waxed and have walked with the wind what while we slept, this side, that side, hurling a heavy-headed hundredfold what while we, while we slumbered. Oh, then, weary, why then should we tread? Oh, why are we so haggard at the heart? So care-coiled, care-killed, so fagged, so fashed, so cogged, so cumbered, when the thing we freely forfeit is kept with fonder a care, fonder a care kept than we could have kept it, kept far with fonder a care, and we, we should have lost it, finer, fonder a care kept. Where kept? Do but tell us where kept, where? Yonder. What high as that? We follow, now we follow. Yonder, yes, yonder, 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 yonder. A few years later, Hopkins wrote a group of sonnets which chart out an area of extreme spiritual desolation and isolation, a group which has come to be known as the Terrible Sonnets. From them, I've chosen this. I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. What hours, oh, what black hours we have spent this night. What sights you, heart, saw, where's you went. And more must in yet longer lights delay. With witness I speak this, but where I say hours I mean years, mean life. And my lament is cries countless, cries like dead letters sent to dearest him that lives, alas, away. I am gall, I am heartburn. God's most deep decree, bitter would have me taste. My taste was me. Bones built in me, flesh filled, blood brimmed the curse. Self yeast of spirit, a dull dough sours. I see the lost are like this, and their scourge to be, as I am mine, their sweating selves, but worse. Finally in this program, a new voice, and at this point, a very young one. In 1886, Rudyard Kipling, at the age of 21, published his departmental ditties in Lahore, where he was working as a journalist. Kipling, from the beginning, made India, or Anglo-India, his special province. It's not too much to say that, from an imaginative point of view, he created it for the world. From departmental ditties, I've chosen one which isn't perhaps very typical, but I like its laconic, dry, sinister flavour. The story of Uriah. Jack Barrett went to Quetta, because they told him to. He left his wife at Simla on three-fourths his monthly screw. Jack Barrett died at Quetta ere the next month's pay he drew. Jack Barrett went to Quetta. He didn't understand the reason of his transfer from the pleasant mountain land. The season was September, and it killed him out of hand. Jack Barrett went to Quetta and there gave up the ghost, attempting two men's duty in that very healthy post. And Mrs. Barrett mourned for him five lively months at most. Jack Barrett's bones at Quetta enjoy profound repose, but I shouldn't be astonished if now his spirit knows the reason of his transfer from the Himalayan snows. And when the last great bugle call adown the Hernai throbs, and the last grim joke is entered in the big black book of jobs, and Quetta graveyards give again their victims to the air, I shouldn't like to be the man who sent Jack Barrett there. <laughs> 